Good evening, everybody. Good evening. My name is Mark O'Shane. I work for your New Hampshire Fish and Game Department. I'm the Advertising and Promotions Coordinator here for the agency. And I want to welcome you to the first of our uh, Adventure Series talks for 2018. Um, there's someone here that's kind of to blame for this whole thing. His name's Dave Freeby. Raise your hand, Dave. Dave does uh, a number of seminars for us uh, in turkey hunting, including the very popular uh, Hunting Mature Bucks. Dave and I were having a conversation about seven or eight years ago. Time's going by so fast, I'm grayer, but he's better looking. Uh, about doing something to provide quality experiences, quality, quality presentations to folks so they can enhance their skills or develop new skills. And it's also a way for us to say thank you to the folks who have been with us for a long time and say welcome aboard to our young anglers or our young hunters. Uh, we've got a very, very diverse crowd in here tonight, which I'm very pleased to see. Uh, ages all over the place. So this is important for all of us. Typically when we look across the room when we do these seminars, it's very gray and shiny, if you know what I mean. Um, we can't do this on our own, maintaining the sports that we all love. We don't want to see it go away. No. So ask somebody. Invite somebody to go fishing. Invite them on January 20th. Why is that significant? Free. 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 You gotcha. Yeah. So let's all take advantage of that. So a little bit of housekeeping. Um, put your cell phone on vibrate, please. Note where the exits are. Restrooms are halfway down the hall. Uh, the way you came in, the way you go out, it's going to be on your right hand side. Um, this this presentation is being recorded in two different formats. Um, it's being recorded on Facebook Live tonight. <clears throat> and it's also being recorded by community television, which you'll find in your local area at some point once they get the production done. Um, tonight's presenter tonight. Tonight's presenter tonight. That's pretty good, huh? Say that three times. I'm not going to say it anymore. It's for the Department uh, of Redundancy he's, Department. He's a good friend of mine. We've fished a lot together. Um, we've developed a lot of different skills and just have a lot of fun. I have a lot of love and respect for this person. Um, Tim's a noted New Hampshire guy. I believe he holds a world record with a tip up for a white perch. I think that's the picture in the background there. Mm -hmm. um, that sealed the deal for that. He's he's um, he's a, he's a sponsored pro for Clam um, and other other companies. He's going to go over all that stuff. I'm going to steal all his thunder. Um, he's going to give us a lot of information tonight. Drink it all up, people, because it's a long, long ice fishing season. Tim, thanks, Mark. All right, Mark asked me to give him a minute to get his Facebook Live going, so I figured I will uh, post a, we're gonna do a selfie, because there are a lot of you here. Everybody okay with that? Yeah. All right. Everybody wave. Nice. I'll tag every one of you on Facebook. How's that, we're good to go? All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. <laughs> there are a lot of you. Uh, it's good. I like to see a lot of people. I, it's funny. People ask me all the time if how I speak to large groups all the time, and I tell them it's it's when there's like two people standing there staring at me that I get nervous. So uh, there is a lot of information that I'm going to try to share tonight, and I'm going to try to roll through it as quickly as I can. So if you have questions, don't wait till the end, because um, you might run out of time. Might not get me when you see the exodus that happens, and when Mark starts turning down the lights and stuff, you might want to get your questions. So just raise your hand if you have a question, and I'll do my best to answer it as we go along. I'm not going to get into too much about um, myself because it's just going to, you won't hear anything else because I like to talk about me. So um, I am sponsored angler. I'm a full-time fishing guide. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be able to fish year-round. That's what I do for a living. And I, I write articles and some of my sponsors pay me to promote the products that I use. Um, so uh, I feel pretty lucky when I get up every day that I, it's, uh, yeah, I'm pretty fortunate. We'll leave it at that. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about some white perch and lake trout ice fishing. You might hear some stuff you already know. You might not hear things you wanted to hear, ask questions. I'm certainly not the most knowledgeable fisherman out there. I'm probably one of the most passionate, though. So I'm just going to share you know, what I do, how I do it, where I look, uh, and what I'm doing when I go on the ice and what I'm thinking about and when I'm looking for white perch. And then when we get towards the end, there's some lake trout stuff in there. So feel free to ask questions. So our white perch, we are pretty uh, fortunate in New Hampshire. We have a very unique fishery, uh, New England, North Northeast in general, but Lake Winnipesaukee has some enormous white perch in it. They're some of the largest 
white perch anywhere in North America. Uh, they say if you look statistically, the average size of, of white perch is, is six inches. Mm -hmm. They're uh, uh, typically a brackish water fish. And um, I've caught very many six inch white perch in Lake Winnipesaukee. Yeah. So the, they're, you know, pound and a half to two pounds is usually the average. Um, three plus pounds, not uncommon. Those are three pound fish. And I will dispel one myth right now because I get this question a lot. Let's see if I can get that to focus. Is, is the, are those fish photoshopped? No, they're not. That was, that was the day, same photo. So uh, people ask me all the time, they say, oh, that fish is photoshopped. Well, it's not. Anyway, uh, there are some huge fish in Lake Winnipesaukee. Um, if you look at Michigan state record, 2015 was caught, was two pounds. We catch those every time we go. Every time we're on Winnipesaukee, we catch fish that are bigger than Michigan state record, uh, bigger than most states state record. If you go to places like Minnesota, they, they, they cringe at the idea of having white perch in their waters because they're uh, in waters that have walleye, white perch are actually invasive because there are times of the year when they feed 100% on, on uh, white bass and walleye eggs. So they don't want them in walleye country at all. But we don't have any in Winnipesaukee, so we'll, uh, we'll take it. They are some of the largest in North America, but why? People ask me all the time, why are they so big here? How did they get to be so big? Uh, they're very successful for one thing. Um, that's why they don't just die off even on years when like the smelt population cycle is kind of low. The white perch cycle isn't, um, isn't hit really all that hard because they're so successful. One large female white perch can lay as many as 300,000 eggs. That's just one. Uh, and those eggs will hatch in two to four days. So very, very fast. There's very little egg predation. Um, unless you get, you know, if they lay it one night, one day, and then the next day it drops into the 20s, you might get some egg die off, but they're typically very successful. The other reason is the rainbow smelt. This is probably the biggest reason why they're so big, uh, not so much why there's so many of them. Um, smelt are very high in lipids, fat, very, very high lipid concentration. If you, was anybody here last year for this seminar? Yes. You'll, you'll hear some stuff from last year because you know, the white perch haven't evolved that much, so a lot of it's not gonna change. Uh, hopefully. I've learned some things over the course of the year, and I'm able to share some new stuff. But if you were here last year, you'll hear a lot of redundant stuff, possibly. But um, it's stuff that's of interest to me, so I'm pretty passionate about talking about it. Um, high lipid intake means, means the capacity for larger growth and more energy, which means they can feed more, which means they can get bigger. They're putting on more fat, which makes them bigger, especially you know, in March. Any white perch anglers here that, that fish for them regularly? None? I figured there had to be a couple. You notice they're big in March. Oh, hey, how are you? I thought you couldn't make it. Uh, they're huge in March. They seem bigger because they're putting on more fat and, and more eggs. Um, so that's that lipid concentration. Um, lipid concentration in smelt, a unique thing, it doesn't increase much in size, very little, if any, at all. So when the smelt gets bigger, lipid concentration doesn't, doesn't change. Um, any, anybody here troll for lake trout and salmon in the spring and summer? And they're, when they're throwing up smelt, a lot of times they're little. Yeah, they're tiny. And that's not by accident. They're targeting those because if the lipid concentration of a, of a smelt this big is the same as a smelt this big, and you want to increase your lipid concentration, you're gonna eat, you can eat more of those little ones. Uh, they're not stupid. You know, they have it figured out. It's like bears. They know what food to eat you know, to put on that fat. In 2000, they did a, a study in the Great Lakes on um, seven species of fish. And those are the seven species. So they studied cohos, elives, um, I don't even know what a bloater is, but and rainbow smelt. Lipid concentration increased in size uh, with every single species except smelt. So that's the kind of the key here with our white perch getting so big uh, and being so successful and numerous is because they can put on a lot of fat even on years when the smelt population is a little bit down, they can still put on enormous amounts of, of fat by feeding on those smelt. Um, so if high in lipid intake means more growth, there you go. You know, those boxes are the same size, but you can fit an awful lot more of those small smelt. There's 13 times more lipid in that box than in that one. So you now if you're a smelt and putting on more lipids is more fats is what you're looking to do, the smart thing would be to eat those smaller smelt and you can eat a lot more lipids. So they grow fast. Any questions? All right. So basins are probably my, my favorite place to target white perch. Uh, I love to basin fish. It's, it's kind of a, 
you know, when, when Macho and I go out and chase white perch, we typically, the first thing we talk about is which basins are we going to target? Uh, how many do we want to try to fish? And we'll, we'll look on the Navionics and we'll pick out basins if we're going to a new area and we, or we have just, we have these key basins that we, that we target. And I like to fish basins usually 30 feet, but we've caught fish uh, in numbers anywhere from 25 to 60 feet deep. And, you, and I call them resident fish because a lot of times you'll show up to a basin and it might be 10 o'clock in the morning and there's nothing happening. You put the Vexilar in the hole and it's blank. And you drop a jig down there and all of a sudden it lights up. There's just fish that were just sitting in that basin just hanging out, whether it's because they fed early, they're just, it's too sunny and they don't want to move around. For whatever reason, they're in that basin and they just kind of hang out there all day long. And then it's just like lighting a match if you can get one to go. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that as, as we go along. Uh, inside turns is another great area. When fish are actively feeding, they will push smelt into these inside turns as it's like running them into a brick wall. Uh, and once they push them in there and those smelt try to filter up into the shallower water, they get bunched up. Any striper anglers here? Same thing. They're the same family. Actually, they're a member of the temperate bass family, so they're actually probably one of the closest cousins to the striped bass. They feed just like them. They feed in packs. They ambush bait and they'll push bait into, into big balls, push them into the, into shallow waters like these inside turns. And, uh, and ambush in there. Uh, some of my favorite lures, I moved some stuff around, so it threw me off a little bit. I forgot that I moved stuff to the end. I was like, where did all those slides that used to be there go? <laughs> um, I fish a lot of Clam Pro Tackle. Um, yes, they're one of my sponsors, but um, they have a, a team, which I'm fortunate enough to be on, of people that, that test lures a year in advance and tell them whether or not it's worth even bringing them to market. So I like, I like the tackle. I like what they put into it. I like the fact that they find they source the purest tungsten on the market. And I'm getting on a soapbox here, but that's I fish clam tackle because I like it, not because they're my, one of my sponsors. It was the op opposite way. Uh, the epoxy drop is one of my favorite white perch lures. I love that lure. Um, that being said, the blade spoon probably catches more fish. And the only reason the blade spoon catches more fish is because it sinks faster and it gets back down to the schools quicker, because those schools are nomadic and they're going to move on. Uh, or they're going to get spooked, and if you can't keep their attention, then, then they're going to be gone. You might only pull two out of a school, and they're gone. But if you can get back down there and keep their attention, because they're very competitive, when they see other fish chasing bait, they'll stay there and they want more. And as soon as you can get your jig back down there, you're going to catch more fish. And I think the profile obviously helps when they're keyed in on smelt. They're, they're going to key in on the blade spoon a little, bit, a little bit better, but it does. I mean, you're, you're talking a difference between a 64th ounce and an 8th ounce, so that blade spoon gets down there really fast. So we catch a lot of fish on those. This is a new one this year, <coughs> excuse me, that I haven't fished yet, but when I first saw that, I mean, what does that look like? Smelt. Smelt. I was like, yep, I'll take 20, because uh, I know it's going to catch, it's going to catch fish. I mean, uh, this is a picture of this one has a treble hook. You'll see this one has a single. What I've done is I've clipped two of the points off. That's actually a picture of one of my blade spoons that I use. Um, I prefer to get like a size 10 Gamakatsu sawash hook and swap them out completely. But when things get going in the winter time, I just don't always have time for it. And I'll just take a pair of snips and cut two of the points off. So that's what I'll do on this if I want to put bait on them. Um, but a lot of times you don't even need it if you can get a school fired up. But those are some of my favorite lures. Um, rod combinations, really important to make sure you get a properly matched combination. Uh, it's, um, it's, it's, it, there are so many reasons why, and I'll get into why. But some of my favorites, so when I'm fishing the smaller jigs, like that epoxy drop, I'll fish a 26 inch. I like the uh, Jason Mitchell, the Gen 7 combos. They're just a, a good reel. They never freeze up on me. And I like the bend. It's a nice even bend. Uh, a lot of people like the meat sticks. Uh, they have more of a backbone than a little bend at the end. Um, I just, I get used to that nice even arc, nice bend. And they, if the fish, you get some diggers, really big white perch in there, dig, 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 dig. It's, I like the cushion on those Gen 7 rods. And then when I switch up to the bigger lures, like the blade spoons or maybe a flutter spoon, uh, I'll put on, I'll tie on a 28 inch, I'll tie those onto a 28 inch rod um, and with five, a little bit heavier line. Now, you don't need five pound test line to catch two and three pound white perch unless you want to get your jig back down there as fast as you can. So there's a certain amount of muscle and that needs to take place because if a school moves in and I'm by myself, the only way to get my jig back down is to get the fish up. And I don't reel them up fast enough to, to kill them if I'm not keeping them. And I usually only keep what I'm going to eat, you know, relatively soon. Um, but I want to be able to get them up as fast as I can without hurting the fish so I can get my jig back down there before the school leaves because sometimes I'm only going to get two or three 
out of a school and they're just they're just moving along they're looking for a school of smelt they're not looking for that one jig that keeps going up and down and taking friends with it so those are my two favorite combos I typically have a couple of each of these combos I'll have a couple 26 inch rods with different size different color epoxy drops maybe green ones uh, a green one and, and I always have white in Winnipesaukee the water there's so crystal clear that white seems to work the best they seem to see it the best from the farthest uh, and I'll have a couple of 28 inch rods with a white and probably a pink blade spoon or a white regular blade spoon and a white rattling blade spoon with a little Pyrex rattle on it just for some noise just if you're trying to call fish in from a distance it, it sometimes will help yes do I find my catch rate goes down with higher than five pound test I don't know I've never tried it <laughs> um, we've had we've had white perch moving while we were lake trout fishing you know with six and eight pound test leaders uh, and still caught fish but I think uh, they do start they tend to figure it out a little quicker um, the biggest thing is is the action of the rod um, all right um, it, there might be a slide about this later so you'll have to pardon the redundancy but the, the biggest reason for the, the 26 inch rods and the four pound test line and not going any heavier is because that 164 ounce jig won't straighten six pound test line out when it's cold you'll have especially if it's fluorocarbon you'll have little kinks in it and every time you, you, know, you want to give it that little cadence, that little tap, 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 tap on those little jigs, well, every time you do this, that jig's floating up, and it's just doing that, and it's not even going that fast because it's not heavy enough to pull the coils out of that thicker line. So that's the biggest reason that I use it. Fluorocarbon is pretty invisible underwater, so even like a six-pound fluoro is, is not going to show up, and we have six-pound fluoros on tip-ups, and there are days you can't keep the flags down because they're, they're just hitting them left and right. Uh, but you really can't make that lure do what it's designed to do. Uh, if it's not heavy enough, to, if your line is too, um, too, th too thick. And then obviously if you go too thin, you're gonna, just going to end up breaking off left and right. Any other questions? All right. So I fish worms and spikes. It really depends on the day and my mood. Um, and the fish, obviously. My dad used to have a saying that he used to love to say to me when we go fishing. He'd say, Tim, because I'd be, oh, I want to try, I really want to make the fish eat this lure. I want, you know, I want to try this lure. And, you know, I'd go bass fishing with him and I'd have a saltwater lure. I just wanted to see if I could make him bite. And he'd say, Tim, it doesn't matter. The fish are going to pick the winners. So the fish, some days they want spikes and some days they want just a little tiny piece of dilly. Yes. What's a spike? A spike is a maggot. Okay. Uh, I, th I, th I don't know for sure, but I theorize that some fishermen started calling him Spike so that his wife would let him keep him in the fridge. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know, yeah. Disco uh, rice. Disco rice, that's a good one for him, yeah. Uh, no, you don't want to name him food. <laughs> they might end up as food. Um, but when I'm using uh, worms, it's just enough to cover that hook. Literally, if there's enough for a white perch to get a hold of and pull it off the hook, they will. It's like, we can't seem to get them to hang around on camera, so we don't use them. We've tried putting a camera down when a school moves in, and they leave. They won't stick around with a camera hanging there. So we just stop. And it's so time consuming when the school moves in. You know, like if I'm fishing with Chuck, we look at each other like, who's, who's going to mess with the camera and who's going to get to keep fishing? Uh, so we just don't do it. But they will, they will strip that bait off in a heartbeat. Uh, and the bite is often very subtle. My general rule is the bigger the white perch are, the lighter they bite. A big, smart, crafty old white perch will come up and just put its mouth on that. And you won't even, you won't feel them. You won't see the rod move, nothing. You gotta watch, we watch the Vexilars. We run sonar flashers and we watch that mark come in and then we feel, we just keep working. We always play keep away. We always keep the jig moving away from the fish because it's so subtle. The only way to detect those bites is if you keep it moving away and you make them pull on it and you feel the weight there and set the hook obviously uh, and let the fish decide the cadence you know I talked about those those small drop style jigs you get that little tap 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 cadence so you're just trying to make that jig bounce in the water like that and kind of sit in one spot um, some days that's it other days it's just a dead stick uh, some days you got to play that keep away all the time which is most often the case um, just mix it up that's when I get there I have one that works best most of the time for me, and I'll just, if that doesn't seem to catch any fish, uh, I'll just mix up my cadence and keep trying different things until I find out uh, what it is the fish want that day. Uh, I already said that, play the keep away. Anybody not familiar with Navionics? All right, Navionics is, it's a boating app that you can put on your smartphone, you can view it on your computer, 
and you can buy a chip for a GPS, like for your fish finder. A lot of people will use them lake maps in the, in the summertime in the Lawrence or Hummingbird. Uh, well, it's also, we use them in our, in our, we bring our sonars off the boat and we put them on our snow machines in the wintertime and use just the GPS because it gives us a lake map and it tells us where all those humps are. It's very, very detailed. And the great thing is I have the boating app on my phone so I can sit at home um, and I can use um, the web app. If you go on the navionics.com, click on web app, you're going to get all the same information on your computer for free. So you can sit at home where it's nice and warm and drink your coffee or whatever you drink when you're on the computer and look for areas, basins, uh, inside turns, oh, let's, and you, you plan out a day. And you know, find like we usually find six basins if we can in an area that we can fish in a day and we'll identify those six. Then I can pull out the boating app on my phone and I can put a waypoint on all six of those basins. Now that's normally enough, but I hate having my phone out in the cold. So as soon as I get to my snow machine, I, I put those areas in on the, on the Navionics chip on my GPS. It's a lot of steps. Um, and I don't always do that because we know the lake pretty well. So sometimes we'll just say, you know, there's a basin, a couple of basins off of Cal Island. Let's just go try those. And then when we get there, we'll find them on the, on the sonar. But if you want to, you can put waypoints, transfer them, find them at home, transfer them to the GPS, get on the snow machine, and then, you can, then we can just drive. Drive around, go right to it, uh, check the ice if we need to check the ice. Uh, the great thing about having the, the chip on the, on the uh, GPS is we run the track mode. So if we get a year with a lot of pressure ridges on Winnipesaukee, they've changed. We've seen them. I've, I crossed a pressure ridge last year. It was rock solid at 7 o'clock in the morning with uh, three clients. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, the ice was moving. It was really sunny. It was warm. You could tell the ice was booming and cracking and popping all day long. And I said, we should go check that pressure ridge. And sure enough, we got back there, and it was eight feet of open water. It had collapsed. Uh, and so I brought them to an island, and they walked off the shore of the island. And then I found an area that I could get my snow machine across by myself um, without you know, taking my you know, in shallow water and just keeping it safe. Um, but that's the benefit of that track feature is sometimes we run all day and we'll run seven or eight miles and we check and we find a safe place across a, a pressure ridge when it's dark. When we come back, it might be dark and we can just follow that purple line right back. If the ice hasn't been moving or, you know, we obviously stop and check anyway when we cross them again, but at least it lets us know we've already checked this area. We know it was safe when we came out here. We know which way to go back if we have to. So, but locating those areas, you know, like basins and, and inside turns like these areas here. Uh, if you were lake trout fishing, you could you know, find these humps. That's all really, really valuable scouting information when you're out looking for white perch for those basins and inside turns. Um, talked about a lot of that. You can mark your waypoints, the track feature, and that web app. Definitely check that out at home. <coughs> Even if you, you don't have the, the boating app on your phone or you don't have a snow machine with a GPS fish finder uh, on it or GPS unit on it, you can still do a lot of homework at home, get to know a general area, and then do it, you know, like we did before I had a GPS or a smartphone, and just, you know, that basin looks like it's kind of off that point, and then you get out there and you say, that looks like the point, and you just drill some holes until you figure out that you're in the right spot. And there's no fish there, you're not in the right spot, so you'll find out soon enough. Yes? Is the only definition of a, uh, of a uh, basin is the depth? Basin is a depression. It's a depression. So yep. it's Depression. A basin is, yeah, it's a bowl, a deep spot. Yeah. Yep. Yes? Not only is mnemonics that good for the water, but like if you're hunting, you can drop a pin from spot to a house and it will give you the distance in yards from that house. You yep. That you can use it on land. Yep. And, you know, a lot of times you, you'll look out on the app and you'll think, oh, that doesn't look that far away. And then you, you can drop pins from one to the next and f figure out that if you're walking, like, oh, it's three miles. I don't want to walk three miles. Uh, or if, you know, um, I don't know where Chuck just went, but his, his nickname is, is last, one last cast Chuck because he's one more cast and, you know, he'll fish till dark. Uh, and he'll say, what's that next base? And I'll be like, Chuck, it's three miles away. We don't, we don't want to go. And, and I know it's three miles away because I can check it on the app. Flashers, I will not go white perch fishing without a flasher. Um, not that you can't or you shouldn't, I just don't like it. Uh, I like, I love to see that screen light up when a school of white perch moves in. I mean, we, Mark and I and Chuck and another friend of Mark's fished one day, it was the last day of the season a few years ago, and we were fishing in 27 feet of water and a school of white perch moved in 
and my, the auto zoom, auto range on my flasher changed from 27 to 12 feet. There was so many white perch under us, it couldn't read through them to get to the bottom. I love it when that happens. I mean, I just, I'm like a little kid opening Christmas presents. I'm just, I'm giggling. I'm just laughing every time I set the hook, it's just one after another. So I love that feeling. I love to find them on the flasher. And the best part about a flasher is uh, it's gonna tell you. So it'll show you everything that you need, really need to know. So as soon as you put that in there, it's gonna show you where the bottom is. And it's gonna show you anything that gets in between that transducer and the bottom. And when I say anything, I mean anything down to an eighth of an inch is gonna show up. So even those little tiny jigs will show up as a red line on that flasher. Um, it'll show you where the fish are in relation to your jig, so if they're up off the bottom, you typically want to stay above them, it'll show you where they are. Uh, but most importantly, it tells you when there's nothing around. It tells you when it's time to move. You can sit in one spot and fish all day long when there are no fish if you want, but I like to move around. Uh, I've, I've tailored my fishing so that it's easy for me to move around. Um, I, I make it, even when I fished, you know, on foot, I made, I made it so I brought less gear and I put less of it out on the ice and I just stayed efficient so it's easier to move. So when that flasher's blank and it stays blank for 20 or 30 minutes, I'm done. Unless it's March and I'm in an area that I know perch have been cycling through, then, and I'll get into that too, uh, then, then I'm just gonna move on. And it's all real time information. It's not, it's not a history floating across the graph uh, like you have in your boat in the summertime. You know, we always make the joke, which way was he going? Uh, right to left. None of that. It's all real time. So as soon as a fish shows up, it shows up on the dial of that Vexilar immediately. When you lift up, you can see your jig. You lift up on that rod, your jig's going up and down with it all in real time. So there's no, no history, um, super short um, delay on most flashers. Any questions about flashers? Yeah. Is there any advantage to the different types of uh, cones that, that some are very narrow, yeah. some are more isolated to a certain spot and other are wider? Are there any advantages or disadvantages? Uh, well, a wider, a wider cone angle is going to give you a bigger coverage area, yeah. um, but they don't typically go as deep. They lose sensitivity the deeper they go. So, you so you'll notice the... Deep water, you're looking for that narrow or... Yeah, you'll notice flashes that go down to 300 feet typically run in 9 degrees, which is very narrow, but they have to concentrate that, that energy to get them to go that deep. Um, a lot of what you're doing when you turn the gain up on a flasher is you just it, it's, it feels or it seems like, especially with like Vexilized ProView transducer, it's almost like you're, you're expanding, you're widening the cone angle. You're not really widening it, you're just widening how much of it the machine is reading coming back. It's always there, but you're just widening how much. So, in 40 feet, most wide, wide angle transducers are going to be, they give you a good coverage area. They're going to give you at least, I think even a 9 degree transducer will give you about 8 feet of coverage at 20 feet. So it'd be about double that at 40. Uh, but a lot of them will run up to like 30 and 40 degrees. So that gives you a pretty wide, pretty wide angle. But really, if your jig's hanging straight down, you know, you don't need to see 15 feet to that side. But it is nice a lot of times if, you've, if you're fishing for stationary fish and you're trying to get them to move off structure or move off the edge of a basin and they don't seem to want to, at least you can know they're there. Another trick with a flasher you can do if you want to see a wider angle is you can kind of swing it either back and forth or in a circle, and just, you're only gonna get blips, but as it goes around, if there are fish to the outside of that cone, it's gonna show up really quickly, and then you can, you can go back and forth and say, oh, yeah, it's over here. There are some fish off to the side here a little bit farther. Um, that's one really good trick that we use a lot. Yes? I noticed on the is the flasher actually on the line, or is it also dipped in the... No, your, so your flasher has a transducer that just sits just below the surface at the bottom of the ice, and it shoots its signal down. No, it's, well, it's on a float. It's a separate, it's not attached to your line. Oh. It's a separate transducer. I have one in my truck. I should have brought it in. Does it show the picture on the cover? You want to go get one? Yeah, Chuck's going to go get a flasher and you can, you can check them out. Thanks, Chuck. Hmm? No. Um, so the transducer's attached to the, to the unit and it, it's on a float, usually. Be right behind my seat. Um, it's on a float and it sits just below the bottom of the ice. The only reason they say below the bottom of the ice, I actually don't lower mine down that far when the ice is really thick because it'll hit the sides of the ice and you get surface clutter. But I don't fish up near the surface, so I, my transducer is usually only down maybe a foot. And the reason I do that is because if the ice is 30 inches thick yeah. and you're hole hopping from hole to hole, you're walking around like this with a, with a Vexlar with you know, four feet of cable hanging all day long in a fishing rod. So and it's it just, matter. it's tiring. To the of the ice, huh? You don't have to. 
it's, it is going to affect your cone angle a little bit and you are going to get a lot of surface clutter up near the top. But if you're fishing in 40 feet of water and you're lake trout fishing and they're down near the bottom or you're fishing for suspended fish, it, it doesn't really matter. Um, you know, in 40 feet of water, you're not going to lose. It's negligible what you'd lose. Any other questions about flashers? <coughs> All right, so just like striped bass, there is a hierarchy amongst schools of white perch. You typically, when a school of two pound, when you start catching two pound fish, most of them will be two pounds. You'll catch a few that are smaller and a few that are bigger. Um, the bigger ones are typically down near the bottom of the school. And the reason you don't catch as many of them is because you, if it's a big school of fish, you just can't get your jig by, by those smaller fish. Uh, but if you can drop it right to the bottom, sometimes you have a chance at picking off those bigger ones. Or when all the smaller ones smarten up, sometimes those bigger ones that can't compete with how fast the smaller ones can swim, that's when you'll, you'll catch a couple of them. But uh, we catch a lot of big fish in the, in the afternoon and evening at last light. Um, it's just like they move in. The only thing that stinks is when they move in at last light and as soon as it gets dark, it's like they're there and they just won't. They just don't want to bite. They get really finicky and they can't see it. You know, white jig, you know, shows up real nice during the daytime, but it reflects the available light, so it turns black at night. Same thing with a shiny reflective jig. It's going to reflect the light that's available, so it's going to turn black as soon as the sun goes down. So we've never, usually by then we're tired and cold, so we just leave. Uh, and there was always, always a triggering factor. Um, there's a flash. You can check it out when we're done, and uh, we can tell you all about, more about it if you want. There's always a triggering factor. We've, we've moved into schools of white perch that were just enormous and can't seem to get in the bite and have to work for a while to figure out how to get them to bite, whether it's because it's a windy day or they're pressured, they've been, a lot, they've been caught a lot, a lot of anglers have been targeting them in, in this particular area and they'll just, they just become finicky sometimes. You gotta figure out what that triggering factor is. The other thing is, a lot of times if you can trigger one in a school, they're so competitive and they're so, they get so frenzied that you can you can trigger the whole school. It's just, it's just ridiculous. We've gone to places and marked fish, you know, it might be 15 marks on the fish finder, on the Vexilar, and work for a little while, and as soon as you get one to bite, you can't get your jig back down there fast enough because they just go crazy. It's like they can't resist anymore. And those are usually the days that we stop putting bait on our, on our jigs. Just get it back down there and keep it moving. And all, they, all they're doing is they're just shooting it at whatever's moving. You know, they're just, just swiping at stuff and chasing things, and so we just keep it moving and play that keep away, because uh, you'll just spend a lot of time putting bait on hooks that, that you don't really really need to um, spend doing it when, when they'll eat it. Why would you put bait on there if they don't want it, uh, or if you don't need it? And like I said earlier, keep that interest. Keep them around. You've got to keep a jig back down there. Get them up. It really helps to fish in pairs or groups. If, you get, you know, if, if you're out three or four of us, we'll spread out, and as soon as one of us finds a school of fish, we you know, text or call. Uh, yell, whatever we got to do, or just get real quiet. My friends know if I get real quiet that I'm probably on fish, and then they, they all descend. Uh, but, you know, we work together and we help each other out. Because it's to my advantage to tell them to come over in all serious, seriousness, because it's jigs that are constantly going up and down. It's all kinds of movement. Uh, another thing that's going on down there is these fish are regurgitating some of that food because you're bringing them up sometimes from 40, 50 feet down, and they'll, they will regurgitate food as their swim bladders expand. It uh, doesn't kill them, but it's like chum, and it just they, it cloudies the water, um, and it brings in lake trout. Uh, it, it can become it can become really really fun. Yes, question. Is chum effective for whitefish? Not usually. Brings the lakers in. Um, we don't waste any time with chum for for white perch. We've played around with different things. The trouble with with chumming for white perch is you want to chum with something small. Like we've tried, like those. Um, you know, the, like the pellets that you could put in the water, um, the little, um, look like soap, that, like effervescent, supposed to bring, well, the only problem with that is, as soon as they go off, you can't read anything on the Vexilar because that's all the Vexilar picks up is all those bubbles. Um, Vexilars are so sensitive that if you're fishing braided line for lake trout, when you lower your, your line down the first time, all the bubbles that are, all the air that's inside that braided line will cloud up the entire screen on the Vexilar for about five minutes until the bubbles clear away. So any of that stuff that you drop down there is just going to make it harder to see what's really going on. But, but that action of pulling those fish up and then regurgitating some food, it just keeps that feeding activity going even longer. And it makes it harder for them to distinguish between your jig and some food floating in the water. And it just really turns out to be uh, pretty effective on a lot of days. Any other questions? Another one? How about weeds and nymphs? 
how do you fish the weed lines or, you know, there's more oxygen in the water with weed? I don't for white perch. We go straight to that 30, 40 foot basins. Uh, if they're on the move, like on a cloudy day, we'll fish inside turns when they're, when they're target, where they're actively chasing schools of smelt. If the vexillars, the vexillars will show smelt, they'll start as a million little green lines when a school of smelt moves in and all of a sudden the whole thing just turns red. You can't even see your jig, you can't see anything. And I love it because as soon as those smelts start to clear out, there's almost always these big fat red lines left behind. Those are the white perch that are chasing them. And if they're not there, it's oftentimes just a matter of time before they get there. So I don't, we don't ever find them in the weeds. We get to the weeds, we end up catching uh, yellow perch and, you know, depending on where you are, crappie and, and maybe some bluegills and pumpkin seeds, but not very many white perch. Those areas when the white perch do move in, they seem to move out just as fast. So we don't, we don't target weeds. So it's not really an issue when we're white perch fishing. Any other questions? Say they're more active on cloudy days. Oh yeah. Like inside turns, chasing them up and yep. whereas sunny, bright sunny days, cloudless days, maybe they're just hanging low. Yep. Yeah, they're more stationary. Windy days, they don't seem to feed very much. They're not, there's always an exception to the rule. I think last year on January 1st was that exception. Uh, it was windy uh, and Chuck and I and, and Mark were fishing this one spot and the wind was just howling and we, we just crushed them and it shouldn't have happened, but it did. Yes? Uh, how long do you want to keep your bait on the bottom? Uh, as soon as I get it down there. I'll jig it. Keep it. I just keep it moving all the time. I don't leave my sitting still for very long at all. And I'll talk about pond and bottom too. There's actually a technique that works really well to stir up some action on the bottom. But you got to keep that. You got to keep that jig moving. Um, they very, very rarely um, like it dead stick. And the trouble with a lot of a lot of the jigs is your line's going to get twisted. We fish spinning reels, and you're putting little twists in that line all the time, letting line out, reeling it back in. It doesn't go on and off the reel the same way, so you're always putting little twists in that line. You're jigging it, so it's it's you know twisting up a little bit. So the minute you stop moving that jig, it starts to spin, and it's just most fish don't like it. So if you keep it moving though, it'll stop spinning. So even those small tungsten jigs that hang horizontally in the water column, and they spin when you stop moving them. If you keep tapping it like that that jig will sit in one spot and it won't, it won't spin at all. It'll sit there in one spot. And if it does spin, it's very, very slow. Okay, mobility is probably most days the biggest key to uh, finding, at least finding and someday staying on white perch, being able to move around. Now, not everybody's gonna go out and buy a brand new bear cat and have racks put all over the front and back of it and, and all that. I chased white perch by on foot a lot for a long time uh, walking, you know, three, four miles one direction just to fish in my way out, fish all day, and then get to the end of the day and realize I'm four miles from where I started. I got to go all the way back. Um, but if you can, it sure is nice to be able to hop on a snow machine, have all your gear right there, because some days those fish move in, and if there are more than one of you, um, the, the one day that uh, Mark and I and, and Chuck fished a couple years ago, and, and Mark friend John, we weren't really doing much. We were just hanging out. We'd had lunch. We had a little bit of success in the morning. We're kind of hanging out, shooting the breeze. And we looked to the south, and there was some weather moving in from the south, some clouds. And it was literally like somebody drew a line in the sky, and the south, southern end of it was all gray. And we kept watching that moving towards us and moving towards us and moving towards us. And we were just kind of, you know, gabbing away, not paying much attention to what was going on. And the cloud cover moved over, and Mark, Mark was actually the one that got my attention. He said, what do you think this cloud cover is going to do to these fish, Tim? And I looked down, that was the moment when my vexillar went from uh, 27 feet to 12 feet. And I was like, oh my God, it's going to turn them on. And we, we caught fish. We left those fish biting. I think that was, I usually keep a limit once. It's usually the second or, or last day, second to the last or last day of the season, I'll keep a limit because I'm not going to be out white perch fishing again for a while. And I, I like to eat them in the spring and summer. So I will keep a limit then. Uh, and so we, I think we all ended up catching a limit and left those fish. They were still there and still hungry and still biting. So that was the, ma the magic of a, of a low pressure front moving in. They get long periods of low pressure and that'll shut them down. Eventually they're just not gonna, changes in pressure affect their swim bladder. So high pressure kind of squeezes it, low pressure lets it expand, but eventually they get uncomfortable when it's sustained low or high pressure. Um, now they gotta eat, so at some point you know, you'll notice that when the low pressure moves in, the activity's really good, they bite really well. Uh, and then a day or two later, if the pressure's still low and you get a long period of storm weather that moves in, they'll shut down. But eventually they're gonna get hungry. It could be the pressure change. 
It's oftentimes the pressure change when the pressure starts to rise back up again and normalize a little bit, they'll turn back on. It's usually just a timing thing. If the pressure stays low for a really, really long period of time, then eventually they're going to eat. Uh, but you will have days when you go out and it's nice and cloudy and you think we're going to crush them and you can't find them. We've, we had a couple of days like that last year where we just struggled and it was, should, have been a perfect, should have been a perfect day to catch white perch and we struggled. So we do still sometimes struggle. Um, so these, the mobility is important because those fish are always on the move. <coughs> so that day that we all fished together, we knew what direction those fish were going because we were in a line. And the first person in the line started to catch fish first. And then next thing you know, the next person in the line is catching fish. They're both catching fish. Then the third person is catching fish. Then everybody's catching fish. And, and eventually, as that school moved through, the, the reverse happened. And then the first person wasn't catching fish. And then the second wasn't. And then nobody's catching fish. And we knew those fish went north. The next day, I went back in the afternoon. And I don't know. I'm guessing it was the same school. They came back the other direction. That's all I know. It was right at, at daybreak. Um, there was a guy. Uh, his name is Corky. Um, it's a name I don't forget. I'm not good with names, but I remember names like Corky. Uh, I followed a school of white perch for half a mile, and I would, you know, they, I would have nothing going on, and all of a sudden I'd be into them really thick, and then they'd be gone, and I'd move a couple hundred yards, I'd drill a couple more holes, and sure enough, they were just feeding. They were following the school of smelt, and they were feeding their way down, and I got all the way down to the end of this long straight stretch where I was following these fish, and there's Corky standing there waiting for me. He says, I've been watching you out my window with binoculars. He says, you're following the same school of fish, aren't you? So I think so. Uh, I like to think so. Uh, either that or I've just been super lucky all afternoon because I don't have to wait long and they're there again. So if you can figure out uh, which direction the, the school of fish is moving, well, a lot of times you can, you can either come back later that day or around the same time the next day and they'll come back through uh, the next day. It's not going to happen every time, uh, but they are nomadic and they are uh, very um, creatures of habit uh, and they're food oriented. So if the smelt all, you know, big schools of smelt migrate up into a bay, all the way up into a bay one afternoon, they're probably going to migrate back out in the morning or sometime the next day, so be ready. And that's where a lot of people come in handy because you can tell. When I'm alone, I don't know which way they came from and which way they're going. I just know I was catching them, I wasn't catching them, now I am, and then I wasn't again, which way they go. And then you have the 50-50 chance, you got to pick a direction and go with it. And sometimes you're right, sometimes you're not. But being able to, to be as mobile as possible is, is really going to be really going to be key. We do a lot of run and gun fishing when we're out there. Uh, we, when we're guiding, uh, we, we tell, I tell all the clients that call and want to book trips when they want to say, we want to chase white perch, there's seven of us. I'm like, seven of us are not going to chase white perch. Seven of us are going to do our best. We're going to get into areas that the white perch are going to move through at least once. We'll move a couple times during the day, but we can't run and gun with seven people. It's just too hard. I don't have seven snow machines. So running and gunning with two or three people or if everybody has snow machines, you can really get out there and spread out, find those fish. Because a lot of times you'll find a school of fish and you beat on them for an hour and they're, they've had it. They've figured it out. They've seen that jig. Some of them have eaten it. They've seen what happens when their buddy eats it and they're just, they shut off. You, especially if you're letting fish go, those fish go back down stressed. It starts to stress the school out and eventually they'll shut down. You might do very well and you might catch a limit depending on the time of year. Other times, you might catch five or six, and then they're done. You might catch a dozen, and then they're done. And you want to move on either to another school, or they've moved on. And they're not the smartest creatures in the world when it comes to, you can find a school in one basin, wait for them to shut off. If they move to another basin, and you drop your jig back down there, they're like, oh, look, food. And it's not like they're like, oh, no, that's the same one from over there. Don't eat it. They don't, they'll eat it. They almost always eat it. So mobility is, is key, but not always. Some days in late season, this is a picture from uh, last March, late March, and that's a client, and we were on the ice until about, we, were, we got there at seven, we were fishing, it was about nine o'clock in the morning, and, and we hadn't seen anything, and we were in a spot that we'd been doing very well, and he was making jokes. Uh, he's like, you're just, you're just waiting, you're just making me wait, aren't you? He's like, you're gonna bring me to the really good spot in an hour so I don't get greedy, that way if they shut down, I've, I've spent the morning quiet, and we don't start strong, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's exactly what I'm doing, and we made a move. Uh, and we get into this spot here. In fact, uh, I called Chuck. He left work early because as soon as we got to this place, this fish just kept coming back and kept coming back and kept coming back. And they were there from about 9 o'clock in the morning until dusk. They just kept coming back. And you could catch all you wanted. So he, we, he, he caught his limit, and he's like, do you want, 
do you want if you want to catch fish and catch some fish to keep you can so I caught a few uh, and that was our catch from uh, 9 to what did he leave 1230 that day he was like yeah I'm good can you bring me home I'm good I brought him back to the launch at 1230 uh, and went back out and we fished until dark it was just it was just unbelievable I mean those are the, those are the, the days like that are the reason that I spend every day out there all went along chasing these fish around looking for another day like that yes Do your clients take all those fish clean no they take their limit yeah, uh, yeah and, and clean them and eat them I hope I don't know what to do with them when they get them home but he comes back a couple times a year so I know he eats his because as soon as I know when they're gone because he calls to book another trip <laughs> <laughs> I'm actually taking him out tomorrow yes what's the limit 25 fish is the limit per person so yeah I mean the day that there was four of us and we caught 25 fish that were all over two pounds I mean uh, I caught fish that day two of them one was 3.1 pounds and one was 3.3 pounds uh, so I mean you get 25 of those if you're on foot that's you know that's a lot of weight that's a lot of weight uh, you, trust me you you bring a bag that's for a normal amount of fish and you put 25 three pound white perch in it and you're like well where are the other 15 gonna go you know because they don't all fit so in March they will cycle around they're, they're they spawn in the spring they know when we get the higher Sun longer days the Sun's more direct the day longer periods of daylight uh, they know that it's about time to spawn you start to get uh, less snow and more rain you get runoff from melt because the Sun's more direct so you get more fresh water running in there so there's the water becomes more oxygenated and that all that combined triggers these fish to start feeding because they know that when that ice goes out it's going to be time to spawn and they're going to need as much energy for that as possible anybody ever seen a white perch in a bay when they're spawning they look like they're dead they're just floating everywhere because they get so full of spawn they can't right themselves well, that can't be easy uh, I'd, I'd want to eat a lot too uh, to prepare for that if I knew it was going to happen every year uh, and it sounds like our Thanksgiving yeah. uh, so it's a lot of energy so they, they feed sometimes all day and they will just chase schools of fish schools of smelt and if there's no smelt around and they're in an area near where they spawn uh, then they will just keep cycling through looking for food and if you've got four or five or six jigs down there maybe a couple tip ups out you're gonna stay pretty busy because they will just keep coming back around smelt on tip ups yeah we don't fish tip ups very often for white perch unless it's slow they're like anchors it's just like putting an anchor it's the same thing with cameras even if a camera didn't spook them it takes so much time to put them down you get time to get it down there everybody's laughing your my buddies will be laughing at me because I spent all this time to set the camera and the fish are gone they've been catching them the whole time I'm messing with the camera and now the fish are gone so tip-ups oftentimes are light anchors like anchors but if you can't move around or you don't want to move around uh, or it's a bright sunny day you certainly worth your time to spread out as many lines as you can so having that jig rod and a tip up because uh, you're only allowed two lines on on Winnipesaukee so having that extra line somewhere else if a school does move through then you know it goes off the white perch I run over with my jig rod as soon as the flag goes up because if it's a white perch I'm gonna get my jig back down there and catch them while they're there so late in the season oftentimes you can just sit in one spot and just wait for that school to come back but not not always yes Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so I, I do have multiple lines rigged. You just can't fish them all at the same time. But rather than change my lure, I can just grab another rod. That makes sense. That's the. Any what? Any limit to the number of rods or anything? That you can bring with you? Right. No. 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 As many as you can carry. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're just only allowed to fish two lines at a time on lake trout and salmon lakes, but you can't catch salmon. So I don't even know why we say that in the winter time. Any questions? Any more questions? Okay. <coughs> I've already talked a lot about the smelt. Um, finding those smelt is oftentimes a key to finding these fish. Large cloud, clouds of smelt, even if there are no big fat red lines, when the cl cloud of smelt moves out away from your fish finder, you, you see them come in all those green lines and then it turns red and you can't see anything and then they're gone. I like to see those big fat red lines. They're not always there, but at least that's a good sign. That's a good sign if there's bait, then there's going to be something around chasing them you know eventually most of the time I mean obviously it's fishing and you, we don't always get it right but smelt is the key we'll have certain areas that we do really really well for for white perch in some years we just never mark any smelt uh, I think last year was one of those years and some of our known white perch spots 
we just never marked any schools of smelt and we didn't really catch any white perch. And then there have been days where it's just school of smelt after school of smelt after school of smelt and we're like, we're at a white perch. Um, there must be schools of smelt somewhere else because they weren't on them those days. But typically we follow the bait. Um, like I said, big clouds of smelt are a good sign and we drill a lot of holes some days. We move around and just keep drilling holes and, and putting the vexillars in and dropping jigs down. And like I said, uh, we do a lot of basin hopping. If you don't mark fish when you put your vexillar in the hole and you don't drop your jig down at least to the bottom and jig it a little bit, you're doing yourself a very big disservice because there might be fish there that just aren't showing up. Question? <sighs> Um, in the summertime, we get them a lot in like 30, 40, 50 feet of water on reefs. Um, it's some years we'll go to a lot of smallies in the same area. So we, you'll go on in the boat and mark fish on a fish finder on the edge of a, of a rocky reef or a rock pile or whatever. And sometimes they're white perch, sometimes they're smallmouth. It really depends on when the water's really warm, like in August, it could be, we don't know. This past August, we, it was a crap shoot. Most of the time they ended up being smallmouth. We'd fish them anyways because sometimes they are white perch. But in the summertime, when the water's warmer, they'll relate to structure more often than, than in the wintertime. But there are some basins that you find them when the water's really warm. That water in that, those deeper basins is going to be nice and cool, and they'll just hang out down there sometimes. And it's just like in the wintertime. Sometimes you'll show up to a 40 or 50 foot deep basin in August, drop a jig down to the bottom, and you could just sit there and catch fish all day long. So yeah, certain times of the year. And then in the spring, they're just gonna be, they're gonna spawn, and then they're just gonna kind of spread out for a little while before they start to regroup, and then they'll, you know, when the water temperature starts to kind of stabilize a little bit, and the thermocline sets up, and then everything kind of resets, so to speak. Um, that vexillar is key. Like I said, I, I won't step onto the ice without it. Uh, it's just because mostly the fun factor, but it really, you know, as a guide, finding those fish is, is important. And it takes a lot of the guesswork and a lot of the stress out of it. But the, really, the big thing is, even when I'm alone, it's just the, the effectiveness and the fun of marking those fish and being able to see my jig. Yes? Uh, yes. Um, fish in the basins. Uh, do you recommend fish in the center or on the outer edges of the basin? That's a great question as far as, yes, where in the basin to fish. Um, if there's a one edge of the basin is typically going to be steeper than the other, that's usually where I start along that steep edge, but there are times that they're just out in the middle of the basin. Sometimes a basin might be oval shaped and they're on one end of the basin. We've fished basins and one person is fishing one end of a small basin, maybe the length of this room, and the other person's crushing fish on the other end and one's catching fish and one is not. So the fish are gonna tell you, I fish the whole thing. I typically will start on the steeper side fish my way across and then we go to the, each end and fish the ends too in case they don't want to move because you got to think about if they've already fed in the morning and maybe it's 11 o'clock in the morning or it's noon time it's lunch time and those fish fed all morning they're not really hungry and it's winter time you know they like water that's in the 60s now it's in the 30s and a little tiny jig this big drops down into the water column from me to you away now if you're a fish you're going to swim all the way over there to get it that one meal, probably not. If it was a school of smelt, the school would probably move over there and, and chase them. But that one little piece of food that drops down that's this big and it's dancing around down there because you're up there jigging away, they're probably not going to swim all the way across that basin for it in the middle of the day. The other thing to remember is their eyes. Their pupils don't dilate and constrict like ours do to, in changes of, in light condition. So on bright sunny days, to adjust to those changes in light, their rods and cones have to change shape in their eye, which takes several hours. So they're not going to dart out from the dark, from a shadow, to a bright spot just for that one piece of food and back again. Uh, they just they can't see as well. Uh, it just takes too long for their eyes to adjust. So there's a lot of factors going on there. So that's why I say drill a lot of holes when we're basin hopping, because sometimes you can be 15 feet, 8 feet apart. Uh, Saturday of the Derby, Chuck and I fished. We pull our snow machines up side by side. And I was catching white perch one after another, and he said, my screen is blank. And I drilled another hole right next to me, and we stayed there until lunchtime. Uh, and, and ended up going back there later on that day and, and caught more fish. They just didn't want to, they didn't want to go that far for whatever, whatever reason. Excuse me. Any other questions? Yes? Do you usually use uh, 
six inch or eight inch auger for you? Uh, I run eight. We do a lot of lake trout fishing too, so yeah. I run an eight inch auger. You can go with a six, but the thing with the white perch is they'll swim in these big circles. I was running. Uh, uh, yeah. Running it is, so the difference in ice from six to eight inches is 50% more ice. So you are drilling more ice. So if you're running like the battery operated augers like we run, you're not gonna get quite as many holes. But I like when they're making those, those wide circles as they get up closer to the hole, being able to get them up there quicker. And it's not as much of a, it's not as small of a hole you're trying to get them through. And if you get a lake trout on, you know, decent sized lake trout, they can be tricky. If you're fishing with a white perch rig that's got four pound test line on it, and all of a sudden you've got a four or five pound lake trout on there, you're trying to finesse through a hole, you know, you're probably gonna break them off. And so we just fish eight inch, it's, it's not that big. We don't, we, we don't kill batteries, you know, enough to, we never run out. So it's no point in going down to a six inch auger. How many batteries do you run a day? Um, if we're drilling a lot of holes, two. Two five amp hour batteries will get us through the day. We bought um, a nine amp hour battery last year and most days that was just the only battery that I used all day. It was one of the Milwaukee 9 amp hour. It's expensive and big, but if I only have to use one battery, then, you know, don't have to keep it warm. Yes? Um, well, you have a lead acid rechargeable battery on it, so you just plug it in when you get home, and it charges itself overnight, and you're ready to go the next day. And the Vexlars typically, they don't recommend using them two days in a row without charging them, but I have forgot to charge my Vexilars before and they use so little power that they will run two full days of fishing if you did forget. Uh, depending, the higher models like the, F, the new FLX models, like that one there, if you're running like zoom, split screen and all the features, you're gonna use more battery and you might not get two full days out of it, but like I said, I have forgot to charge my batteries before and got out there and been like, oh well, hope, hope it lasts all day. <laughs> yes. No issues. no issues. No, it's a lead acid, just like in your car. So it's not like your cell phone. It's, it's going to drain. They, there are no issues on them at all. Yes? I have a Lawrence fish finder, the fish finder 4, I think it is. Um, and and you, can, you can get the ice fishing transducer for it. Have you ever used anything other than the back flowers? Um, I've fished with them. I've never owned one. Uh, the thing I remember with an L's, uh, L. LCD screen is that it's liquid, yeah. so it slows it down in your reaction time, but it's better than nothing, yeah. you know, something's better than nothing. You know, a lot of people don't want to buy a flasher. If you only fish two or three times a year, you don't want to spend three or four hundred dollars on a flasher to only use it, you know, you know, a couple times a year. Most people say no. Some people say yes, and, but a lot of people say no, I'm not going to spend that kind of money. I'll just borrow my friends or, you know, rent one or whatever. But they are a worthwhile investment. I will say I run Vexilars because they don't break. They just don't. They have the lowest failure rate in the entire industry. Less than one-tenth of one percent of all Vexilars um, fail within the first two years. Fifty percent of the ones that do just have bad batteries. So they just don't break. I've, I might have taken a tumble at 40 miles an hour off the back of my snow machine and still worked fine after that. I just, I need that reliability. Uh, and they don't use battery power as much as some of the other units. So that's, that's usually why I stick with that brand, just because they, they work really well and they're reliable. Okay, so I may have already mentioned this, but when those fish move in, get that jig back down there to keep them around. <coughs> and when you get them fired up, a lot of times you don't even, even need to use bait. Um, you can just get it back down there, but you gotta keep it moving if there's no bait on there, because if they get a look and they see that nice shiny little hook hanging there, you're probably not gonna bite it after you've caught you know, six or eight out of that one school. I know they look like a lot of fish. Uh, when they show up, sometimes they might be you know, eight feet, they're eight feet thick. Well, it's fish that are all staggered all over the place. I know it's displayed in a straight line, but they're not like stacked up one over the other. I actually have a slide. I probably should have put that on here to show what it, what it looks like and what it really is. Um, it's not always a thousand fish down there, even though it looks like it on the fish finder. It could be, you know, 15. I've seen schools on cameras, lake trout fish, and see a school of six or eight come through. So um, it's not always uh, a thousand fish. That eat. You know, sometimes it's a few that are staring at that jig and they're like, don't eat it. So that's the end of the white perch uh, stuff. Anybody have any questions before we go on to lake trout? What about Mackie plastics? Are those the one of the epoxy jigs you think do well? Yep. Um, no, they all have their day uh, with the white perch. A lot of times we'll fish like the white Jamie is the Mackie. Probably the most, Jamie and the Maddie 
and some days the um, the minnow. Bring them all and see what works. Yeah, I mean they're in little tiny flat packages, so you could. I mean, I usually have I don't know 25 or 30 packs of Mackies with me in various pockets in there everywhere. I mean, everything I own ice fishing smells like anise oil, so uh, <laughs> that's the, from the Mackie plastics. Plastics do work. I just sort of a lot of days with the white perch, though, you got to have some meat on there. They just want that. They want a piece of worm or, you know, some, some spikes. And change your bait. Don't leave that same old piece of bait on there. Change it up often, as often as you can. I mean, if they're not really biting that well, it's no point in leaving it on there. You might as well take the time to change and freshen up your bait, especially if you fish the spikes, because they do get soft and mushy. And you'll notice when you hook them, there's a little clear liquid that comes out. That's a natural, natural fish attractor. Eventually, that's going to wash out, and you're going to want to change your bait pretty often. No, nope. no, they're tiny, so you hook four or five of them on on one hook. Yes. Uh, will different fish go for these setups? Will different fish go for the setups? Yeah. yeah sometimes we'll have lake trout that will move in. Um, sometimes we catch um, cusk while we're fishing with white perch. Uh, if there are any crappie around, the crappie will eat the same things, same jigs. Yep. Hook size. Um, on jigs, uh, we're fishing 10s and 12s, number 10 and number 12 jigs. They're around 164th ounce. And when, we've, when we're fishing, sorry, I hope I didn't hit the mic. When we're fishing um, like spoons, we usually put size, those are 10s that we buy, the size 10 cell wash hooks that we put on there. Any other questions? Yes. One thing that's great, what's the sizzle for the uh, white perch? Why did you start your presentation with them versus all the other fish in the sea? The what? What's the sizzle? Like, why? <clears throat> is there certain things about the white perch that you find exciting versus the other fish? Yeah, it's, it's so, what, is, what do I like about them? Uh, I like catching them because you, you almost never catch just one white perch. Okay. You know, they fight really hard. They're pound for pound one of the strongest fighting fish we have. Um, you put a three pound white perch up against a three pound lake trout, it's probably going to smoke that lake trout. They are strong, they're muscular, they get bigger throughout the winter, which is really exciting and fun. The schools become more numerous and they taste really good. Um, they are just like striped bass meat, where they have that strip of red meat on the skin side. You can cut that out. Some people will just eat the back strap. Um, we typically just cut a V out of the filet and cut that red meat out. Sometimes we leave it in. Uh, Dave Gens, Every time I'm in Minnesota and we're talking about white perch, he says, I don't like them, they taste like seafood. So if you like seafood, um, you'd probably like white perch. Uh, if you don't like seafood, then you can cut that red meat out. And, uh, and you know, because I never, I was like, what do they taste like? They taste like seafood, you know, like striper or, you know, flounder, depending if you cut that red meat out. They're very mild. The red meat gives them a stronger, a much stronger, it's, there's a lot of oils in that red meat, so it gets in the meat and gives them a much stronger, it's like, Dark meat on a turkey. Some people love it, some people don't. Yes? I fed with my mother and she only loved haddock. She loved white perch. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yeah I, I've had mixed, you know, I've, we've fed it on events that we've done and some people absolutely love them and other people say, we'll do, uh, we do a kayak fishing event every year, Kayak University in June. We do a fish fry and last year we did flounder and white perch and there were people that were like, mm, I like that one but not that one. They didn't like the fishiness of the, of the white perch. They liked the mildness of the of the flounder because we left all that red meat on because we wanted to give people a, an accurate, you know, test on what that stuff tasted like. So they're good to eat. They fight strong. Uh, they're just really fun. Uh, if you question it, get out there and find some or book a trip and we'll show you what, what we like about them so much. I mean, they're just really fun fish to catch and you almost never catch one. It's not like lake trout fishing where you might get one to come through and he might bite, might not, and then you wait. So, and they're fun to, to chase them down. Any more questions? All right, I'm gonna move right along. There's not a ton of slides on lake trout, but uh, I'm gonna move through it kind of quickly. This is part of the reason that I, I run, another reason I run a little bit heavier line than I need to, the four and five pound test, as opposed to like three and four pound test line, because almost always gonna get a lake trout in the mix. I don't think I've ever been white perch fishing and had not had one of us catch at least one lake trout. And you want to be ready for that when it happens because I don't like sacrificing jigs. I don't like fish swimming away with jigs in their mouths and I don't like losing them and it's time. It's time spent retying jigs. So that's one, another reason that my line on my rods is just a little bit heavier than it might need to be. Um,
but I always have lake trout gear with me. I always have rods rigged up for lake trout so that if we're finding that a lot of lake trout are moving through, then we'll switch over uh, to the bigger, you know, 36 and 40 inch rods with braided line and six and eight pound test leaders and, and I'll get into all that. Uh, but that's one of the benefits of perch fishing is being able to get into some of these lake trout too. Um, and they're usually not far from a basin. There's some humps and lake trout love humps. They'll cruise on and off humps looking for food all day long. Sometimes they're chasing those schools of fish, but they're not a schooling fish in the summer, in the winter time. So a lot of winters you'll have fish that are just hanging around, around humps. We've fished, um, you and I and my cousin that one year, and we just sat on these three humps. There was one of us on each hump sitting over these humps and we just fish just kept coming up out of the deep water up on top of the humps and we just kept catching them it was it was a lot of fun so humps that come up to around 20 <coughs> 25 feet out of deeper water around that not too deep some people i know guys that like to fish 60 80 100 feet of water for lake trout uh <coughs> excuse me it's a little too deep for me so uh i, I just don't like i don't like fishing that deep in the winter time it takes too long to get down there and get the fish back up and the numbers don't seem to be as good the numbers of fish that we catch. So we stick with around, around 30 feet of water, you know, give or take 10 or 15 feet. Did you have a question? It just, is the hump 21, is it going up? Is yes. Going okay. Yep. Thank you. And that's just, a, just an example of, I'm I just looking for a place that had three humps nearby. That might not even be Lake Winnipesaukee for all I know, but that is an area that if I found that on Winnie, I would check those humps. I wouldn't just drive right by them on my snow machine. 20 to 30 feet of water, um, drops down to 40 to 60 feet. You know, so if it comes from anywhere from 40 to 60 feet up to 20 or 30 feet of water, I'm definitely going to stop, drop a jig in, on those humps and, and pound it around a little bit. <coughs> I must have taken a slide out that talked about pound and bottom for white perch. That is one thing that's worth noting. There are days when those fish just don't seem to want to bite. And if you drop your jig to the bottom and just rip it up off the bottom and let it free fall a cut two or three times and stir up a little bit of silt, a little bit of silt, reel it up 18 inches or so, you're almost always going to get at least one of those fish that's just not going to be able to resist it and they're going to come in and eat it. You might not trigger a whole school, but it does work very well to get at least one of those fish that are hanging around, especially if you're marking fish and can't seem to get them to bite. Yep. I start right on top and I'll work my way one way. It depends on the size of the hump. If it's a really small one, you won't have to go far, but some of them are pretty big. You know, they might be the size of this room, so start up on the top and then fish our way off. Yeah, because there is a ceiling. I think I'll talk about that here coming up as a bite ceiling. They're, they're only going to come up so, hard, so far, and if you're too far up on top of the hump, they don't want to come all the way up there. They don't want to be that shallow or that bright or whatever it is that day that keeps them from, from going that high. But they will cruise on and off these humps all day, some days, looking for food. Breaks or ledges. <coughs> People ask what breaks are. It's like a ledge. It's a steep drop-off. Uh, this is actually an inside turn here, but you'll see that it kind of forms a like a break line there where it also drops off that way as a, as uh, as well as curves around. Uh, and these are these are great ambush places. They will they will push bait into these. Whether it's uh, the good thing about lake trout is they'll eat yellow perch. So you'll see lots of little yellow perch on the fish finder. That's a good sign because when they go away, you know that they're lake trout. They will eat those little yellow perch. They'll eat each other. Um, they're not really very picky about what they eat as long as they can get something in their mouth. Uh, but this is, these are good areas, break lines, when Lakers are, are actively feeding, so like early in the morning. Um, this is actually a place that I fish a lot, and I'm not going to tell you where it is, uh, but <laughs> they will, we catch fish there really well in the afternoon. So we'll go there, you know, three, two or three o'clock in the afternoon, and we'll just wait, and they're going to come sometime before last light. It might only be the last 30 minutes of the day, but when they come in, they're, in, they're only in there for one reason, and it's to eat and we do really, really well. So steep drop-offs and inside turns are also places for lake trout. Yes? What's the limit on lake trout? You're allowed to keep two fish. They have to be at least 18 inches long. So two fish per person per day. Uh, I don't eat them. I know a lot of people don't like them. I know some people do. I've had clients that never tried them and they wanted to take one home and eat it and I get text messages or emails hours later telling me, I can't believe you don't eat these. They're so good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chuck's not allowed to bring them up out of the hole anymore because they stink up the fish house so much. Uh, they're just, you know, they're 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 strong. They're a strong flavor. So if you like a strong flavored fish, because they're eating those those um, oily smelt, and they also so there's an enzyme in dirt that gives it its earthy smell, 
but it's also found at the bottom of glacial lakes, which is Winnipesaukee, which is where the lake trout spend most of their lives swimming around in that enzyme. So when people say they taste muddy, they smell muddy, they do, because they have that same enzyme that makes dirt smell like dirt. I can't remember the name of the enzyme, but it's true. <laughs> uh, and I don't like them, but a lot of people love them smoked, fried, um, you know, joke, they, we joke, you know, cook them on a cedar plank, throw the fish in the trash and eat the plank. <laughs> uh, that's probably how I'd cook them. Cameras are definitely worth it. You know, we don't, we do stay pretty mobile when I'm lake trout fishing, but there are days when it just pays, especially if we're fishing with chum. You don't want to throw two or three pieces of chum down a hole, which is legal and effective, and then leave 15 minutes later. You've got to give that some time to work and maybe those fish to make up their minds. Camera systems are, are not only effective, but they're a blast to be able to watch your jig and see. On a fish, on a Vexilar, you can see a red line, chasing a red line. One's your jig, one's the fish, and you get a pretty good representation of, oh, he didn't like it when I did that, he swam away. Oh, he liked it when I did that, and oh, he'll only come up just so far. But to watch him come in, <coughs> and that's a piece of chum on the bottom, that's a piece of chum on the bottom, that's a piece of chum. To watch him come in and eat the chum, and then when the chum's gone, they eat the jig. It's just so fun. To not even feel a bite, and you're like, he's got it in his mouth, and set the hook. It's like, you know, it's fish TV. Uh, some of them, the ones we use, you can record it and watch it on a phone or an iPad, and you can record that footage so you can watch it later on. It's not super high res, but it's still fun, uh, but really effective. But it's like an anchor. You drop it down there. You're not just going to, you know, you got to get it down there, then you got to find your jig. Where's the jig? Oh, there's my jig. Okay. Oh, it's moving. It's untwisting a little bit. I got to move it back. You finally get it all set up just right. You know, if those are white perch, be like, okay, they're over here now, we got to go. The lake trout, you're trying to pull them back in, so cameras are, are a lot more effective. Questions about cameras? Yes? About cameras, but do you chum with smelt? Do you just cut them up and let them fall down? I chum with sucker, but I think sucker there's some slides on. Good. Yep, some slides on that. Okay, my rods. Um, the rods that I like the most are the 36-inch Professional Series Ice Team rods. They're expensive, but... They're expensive for a reason. They're super, super nice rods. They're, they're you know, really nice uh, graphite blanks with um, nice wire guides. They don't freeze up, and if they do freeze up, it's easy to get the ice off of them. Um, I just, I, I really like them. Uh, but the Dave Gens, the 40-inch split handles, I always have a pile of those as well. They're a little bit longer, so depending on the size of your fish house, that extra four inches when you go to set the hook, sometimes the difference between 36 and 40 inches is hitting the roof of the house and not hitting the roof of the house if you're in a flip over like one of the fish traps that we that we run. So a 40 inch might be a little bit too long. You find yourself fishing like this. Um, so that's when we'll switch to those 36 inch rods. But the big thing is making sure that it can handle the jigs that you're fishing. You know, there are some, some of the lures that we fish are an ounce and a half. You know, the, the 40 inch split handles is the rod for that. It's, it's tougher to fish that, those lures on the 36 inch professional series because they're a little bit of a lighter action rod so they bend more and you get you lose sensitivity with all when they load up from the from the weight of the of the lure but I mean there's you know heavy rods or a dime a dozen you can spend an entire day at a lot of ice fishing stores just looking at heavy rods or online and some people like jig sticks wooden jig sticks and they like to hand line them uh, and some people like tip ups so lures uh, this is a lure that, that's one of my signature series lures. Daddy Mac Lures makes it. It's called the Nervous Minnow. It's just a jointed jigging spoon. We've had just phenomenal success with lake trout with those through the ice, through open water. They're just really, really good lake trout jigs. Being jointed, they do tend to foul a little bit more often when you're fishing straight up and down because you're not drifting, so there's no scoping going on. So if you give it a one big jig, it's going to flip around and hook your line 50% of the time. So you have to figure out you know, there is a certain cadence. You can let it down a little bit slower and, and uh, keep those jigs from fouling, but they work really well. They're 1.4 ounces, so they're heavy, so we put them on the heavier rods, but lake trout love them. Clam rattling blade spoon, I think that was new a couple years ago. Phenomenal lake trout lure. We broke that out the first year. We were fishing on First Connecticut Lake one day, and we were having some trouble getting fish to commit. And we actually, I think we have it on camera. We, filmed, we were filming that day, and... They were hitting that so aggressively, like they hated it. I mean, they were just inhaling those blades, those rattling. There's just something about that rattle that triggered those fish to bite. And we, you, you had to set the hook as fast as you could because otherwise they'd swallow it. Uh, and, and we had to bring a couple fish home that we didn't want to, that we didn't really want to keep because uh, they were bleeding too much. 
Um, quarter ounce white ones, most of our lake trout waters are clear. So we fish a quarter ounce jig um, for that rattling blade spoon. That's the biggest one that they have. And it's got a nice profile. It displaces a lot of water, makes a lot of noise. Uh, really, really effective jig. And one of my favorite lake trout jigs is the leech flutter spoon. They actually came out with two bigger one sizes this year because the, the bigger fish anglers wanted something a little bit bigger. They were quarter ounce was the biggest they made. Now there's three eighths ounce and half ounce. And they are just, I mean, that quarter ounce is phenomenal for lake trout. There are days that you literally cannot keep the fish off that lure. Uh, and it's just a flutter spoon. You just jig it and let it flutter down and just keep it moving. Keep it, that's the key with lake trout, jigging for lake trout is just keep that lure moving most of the time. Uh, keep it moving. Tube jigs are a staple. Most, uh, I don't know too many lake trout fishermen that jig that don't fish, you know, like three inch white tubes, Berkeley power tubes, um, Berkeley ha uh, Havoc tubes. Um, I don't, I've fished some of the salted tubes and coffee tubes and we've played around with a lot of different ones with very little success, but that could be confidence because I just, you know, I tied on one of those coffee tubes and I was like, this isn't gonna work. So I think I had my mind made up that I wasn't going to catch any fish on it, right? So I spent like 15 minutes and I was like, yeah, I told you. Threw it back in the tackle box and never tried it again. So confidence has a lot to do with it. That jig is that big. And I tell people to target lake trout in March on a jig that big. They look at me like most of you are looking at me right now, like what? There's something about when that snow starts to melt, there's a hatch or there's something being released from the ice that lake trout start to target on. And we found this out white perch fishing because we couldn't keep them off these little tiny 164th ounce jigs. As soon as the lake trout shows up, they eat it right away. We've had days where we've caught 22 fish in an afternoon, all on epoxy drops. They came out with this double XL, which just has a bigger hook. It's a drop jig with a bigger hook, which is great for lake trout because you can get a better hook set. You can get a little bit more bait on there, more maggots. Uh, and late season, I'm telling you that's it looks funny, but we'll have a 36 inch rod with a jig this big tied to the end of it because we can't, we just can't keep the lake trout off it. You put bait on it? You usually put spikes on them for bait, usually white spikes. And bucktails. Um, you know, it's been a staple forever. You can buy AJ's bucktails. He has non lead bucktails and some of his lead ones, he's put a little flapper on there so they're legal um, if they're lead, they have to be uh, over an ounce. But if, they, like I said, you go into ages, you'll see some with little metal flapper hanging off them. It's basically, I guess it technically turns into a spinner bait, so to speak. So it makes them legal for the lead loss. So you can fish those half ounce ones that AJ sells. Um, you put a strip of the belly meat from a sucker, the white belly meat. So we'll buy a sucker and we will cut off the belly meat and save that to, to tip our hooks with. And then all the back meat works really well for chum because it's, it's super soft and it doesn't stay on the hook very well at all anyway. But the white meat's tough and shows up really well, uh, and they love it. Uh, be ready to move, you know. Um, they're, always, they're always on the move. They're always looking for food. Um, they're eating machines. They're like freshwater sharks. It seems like they never stop swimming. You watch them on cameras. They come in and out, and they're always just cruising around. You'll get multiple fish that'll cruise through the same areas, and they're just always looking for the, for the right meal. A lot of times, it's not just a matter of finding food. It's the right meal that they want. Um, Sometimes they're there one minute and then they're gone and then you got to be ready to move around. So I spend longer in a spot with lake trout than I would for white perch, but I won't sit in the same place and lake trout fish all day long. Um, not that it doesn't work, not that they won't move in. I'm sure I've left areas only to have, you know, the bite turn on when I left, but I get antsy and bored and I just, I love that chase, that run and gun fishing. It's fun for me. Even when I'm not catching, I still like, you know, not knowing what's under that next hole. It's like, deer hunting and not knowing what's around the next bend and what's behind that next hill and or bird hunting or whatever. It's, you know, it's that, that chase that I love. Um, so I, I'm always moving around, but I know a lot of people that fish permanent shacks, put their tip ups out, they chum, they rely on the chum and they sit in the same fish, the same place all day long. And we're out there to have fun. So don't let me tell you not to fish like that. If that's how you like to fish, cause it's certainly the reason that we go out there. Um, but I like to fish for the biters, you know, um, yeah, they're pretty definitive. Um, I believe, and I could be wrong, but I believe that a lake trout makes up its, minds, its mind within seconds after it sees your jig, whether or not it's gonna eat it. And if the answer is no, you could spend three hours working that fish and you might get them to bite, but you spend three hours on that one, I'm gonna spend three hours hopefully on three. 
that's just the way that I like to fish. I like to go and, and try to find the biters, find the fish that will commit because I want to tell you, I love lake trout fishing and one of the things I love the most is having a fish come in out of nowhere and come up eight, 10 feet off bottom like a rocket. I mean, hold my breath. I realize every time they don't bite that I've held my breath because they come in so fast, you're like, yep, he's eating it and they get to it and they put on the brakes and they swim back down. Whether it's something I did, whether it's they got a better look at it and they just decided that they weren't gonna like it, they weren't gonna eat it, or they just playing cat and mouse, but I believe that those fish make up their mind pretty quickly whether or not they're gonna eat it. If they're gonna eat it, they'll eat it right away. They come in, they chase it, and they eat it. Now, I've been wrong. Um, we had one day during the derby where we had these fish chasing, chasing jigs all day, all morning, until about 11.30 in the morning, constantly, every five minutes, the fish would come in, chase the jig up eight, 10 feet, wouldn't bite, went back down. Called a buddy of mine, was fishing up to Braun Bay, and I was like, he was a lake trout fish, we had a camera down. I said, you catching fish? He said, yeah, we've been catching fish all morning. He said, but you can't lift your jig off the bottom. He said, you, we move it just enough to make it move, but without lifting it off the bottom. I said, I gotta go, I got one on. I was doing it while he was telling me, and, I, and he had a camera, so he was able to see every time they lifted the jig off the bottom, the fish would swim away. So they were just quivering it on the bottom, and the fish were picking them up off the bottom. And we caught fish that entire day and all the next day just doing that. I've tried that move, I don't know, 50 times since, and it's probably only worked 10. But when it works, it works well. So it's always something that we try before we give up. Yes? How far off the bottom do you typically try? Well, I, I thought there was a slide in here that talks about it. Um, <coughs> there's always going to be a bite ceiling. There's a certain distance up that they'll come, that they'll, and then they won't go any higher. They're going to swim back down. I try to stay, I try to figure out where that is. So when, when I fish near the bottom and we make them chase it, we keep the bait reeling away from them until we see it's oh, 10 feet off the bottom today. They, every single fish, will, they'll only come to a certain point. That's the, their bite ceiling that day. And I'll fish near that, just below it. So if the 10 feet is as high as they'll come, I'll fish around eight feet off the bottom. I found that the, the harder they have to work for it, the more committed they'll be when they get there. So if they're just swimming around, your jig's right in front of their face and they're kind of picky, they might not eat it. But if he swims up eight feet, 10 feet, 12 feet off the bottom, it's a little more likely they've worked for it now. There's a 10% rule. They want to try to get some of that energy back in that they've spent to get it. So they're, a lot of times they're more, equal, more apt to bite if they have to work harder for it. So I fish as, as high up as I can. Um, but it really depends on the day. They can't always see it on a bright sunny day if you're too high off bottom. So uh, the fish will tell you, but I start on the bottom and fish as high up as I can and still catch fish. All right, chum. We talked a little bit about chum. Um, sucker meat is what we use. Now, I've, I don't know as though I've ever dropped. I usually drop three pieces down. I stagger them one, wait a couple seconds, two, three, because we move around a lot, so I'm trying to create as much scent and commotion in the water. And I've, I don't think I've ever done that and not had at least one lake trout or maybe a cusk come in and look. At least look, it always brings them in. Gives you something to work for. They'll come in, they'll eat the chum. Sometimes you'll watch it falling on the vexilla. There'll be three red lines sinking real slow. You see a lake truck come up off the bottom, swim back down, there's only two marks. You know they're eating the chum. Well, every time I throw a piece of chum down there, a lake truck comes in, I'll throw another piece of chum down there. Well, see, he did it again. Don't bite my jig, I'll throw another piece of chum down there. He's feeding them. And eventually, why would they eat that jig when they're feeding them chum? So. Even if they'll eat the chum, but they won't eat my jig, I'll, I'll throw those two or three pieces down there. Uh, if they're eating it, I'll give them a little while, jig, try to get them to come back and make sure that they're still around, see if I can get them. Now the chum's gone, the only thing left for them to choose from is my jig, hopefully they'll eat it. Whatever I have to do to get them to eat it, whether it's dead stick it on the bottom or just leave it hang there or keep it chasing, make them chase it and keep moving it away from them. Over chumming is gonna, it's gonna kill you. I mean, why would they? eat your jig if you're going to keep feeding them chum. Yes? How do you cut up your chum? You just it's half it. inch by two inch pieces, roughly. Depends on how much of it I have. Yeah. Uh, sometimes we go to AJ's to get a sucker in the morning and he's only got 12 inch suckers. He's not going to get as much off of that. So I'm going to make my pieces smaller. Uh, it really depends on, on the size of the fish we want to target. But half inch by you know that long, two inches, inch and a half, two inches. Uh, you don't want to give them a giant glob of you know, meat down there because they just won't, they won't eat it. They'll eat those small ones and they sink slow, nice and slow. You'll see on the vexillar, they cloud the vexillar all up because there's bubbles and scales and God knows what else coming off that 
tell them as it floats down, if you drop a big piece down there, it's just going to sink real fast. Same thing with the strips that we use um, of the belly meat. They're like half inch by, I don't know, inch and a half, two inches, sometimes a little bit longer. I usually cut mine in a little V, a little point. Um, getting them hooked straight is really the hard part. That's the one reason I shy away from bucktails with sucker meat is because it makes your jig spin in a circle almost every single time. If you can watch it on the camera, you'll see it. It's just swimming around in a circle as you jig it. It's just twisting up my line. Um, I, I guess I didn't put it on the slide, but I don't fish swivels on my rods. I get a lot of crap for it. I advise fishing swivels, but as a guide, when a, you get a swivel that's you know three or four feet away from a, from a lure, and you get a client that doesn't fish a lot, first thing they're going to do is reel that swivel up into that tip and crack it. So I would rather strip. I'm only fishing in 30 or 40 feet of water. I would rather strip off 30 or 40 feet of twisted line when it's toast and just tie, on, tie my leader back on and start fresh than deal with the swivels and the cracked guides. And I've had days where the Lakers have come up and bite the swivel. So I just don't use them. It's not that that's the way you should fish, but that's just preference for me. And like I said, I don't mind stripping 40 feet of line off there. I've got to get new line on my reels the next year anyway, so, and I'm not casting with them, so I don't need my reel full. I'm just dropping straight down, so it's not a big deal for me. But if you want to try to get a second year out of it, maybe run swivels, or you don't want to deal with twisted line, then just run a good ball bearing swivel. Um, yeah, so drop a few pieces of chum down there. If it doesn't work, wait. Don't drop a few more right down on top of it. You'll just end up with a pile of chum down there and, and a, a big sucker bone up above. And, that's not really going to be any use to you. Pounding bottom, I talked about that with the white perch. Works really well with lake trout to get them to come in. They're super curious and they're super aggressive and predatory. So they see um, yellow perch often will, will hang out on the bottom and they'll hide sometimes in the silt or in any little structure on the bottom. So they see something kind of moving around down there. They'll come over to check it out. Uh, when they do, we just, we just work that jig away from them a lot of times to get them to try to get them to commit and bite. And that's the bite ceiling that I talked about. They're only going to come up so far. You just got to figure that out. You let the fish will tell you. You make them chase that jig, and eventually they're going to stop. They won't chase it any higher. And you'll start to notice it's almost at the exact same point all day that day. And the next day might be 5 or 10 feet higher or lower. It's, every day is usually a little bit different, but there's always a, a ceiling. Excuse me. And keep it, keep it moving. You know, they have good eyesight. They're wild trout. They're, you know, they didn't live in a hatchery until they were stocked two weeks before you caught it. These are fish that have probably all been caught before, more than likely. Lona Pisaki gets a ton of pressure throughout the year. Most of those fish have probably already been caught. So you got to keep that bait moving so they can't get a really good look at it. And the theory is, um, you know, when a lake trout chases a smelt, smelt doesn't freeze and wait for it to eat it and just stop. And that's what people, they see the lake trout come off the bottom on the vex line, they want to, oh, I'm just going to stop and let him eat it. Well, nothing that they chase stops and lets them eat it. They all run away. So when you stop, I think they know something's wrong, and then they usually turn around and, and head back down. Um, so they have that triggering factor, which could be just the movement, but there's that predatory factor where you've got to keep it moving away from them and kind of tap into that, that predatory instinct. Anybody here fish tip-ups? We fish tip-ups with clients. Um, it's not my preferred method to fish because I'm less mobile when I put them down because they take more time. Um, but I fished tip-ups a lot more last year than probably any other year ever. Uh, and we did really well. And, and you never know, you get a tip-up in the water, like a school white perch might come through and, and you luck out. But there are days when the lake trout will not eat anything except a live smelt. You can make that jig do its most beautiful dance. You can have the prettiest Nice, new shiny blade spoon and they want to smelt, they're not going to eat that blade spoon. Some days they just want smelt. And I'm all, I want to catch fish, so on the days when we can't get them to bite, we'll throw out a tip up, uh, especially for clients, you know, and we'll put some tip ups out and let them do their thing and they always catch fish. Um, similar to, similar setup, except I run, I do run swivels uh, on, on that because they'll smelt it down there swimming in circles. So. Um, those are the thermal tip-ups. They're insulated. They keep the holes from freezing. They really do keep the holes from freezing. The spool's adjustable, so if we're fishing shallow water for like you know, rainbows or whatever, you can pull that spool up a little shallower so it doesn't stick all the way down through the ice. Um, but these, they, 
they do tend to get run over by snowmobilers a little bit more often. So don't put them in the middle of a snowmobile trail because they'll probably get run over because you can't see them. That yellow flag doesn't show up very well. It's amazing that yellow flag shows up when it pops, but when it's down flat, you can't see it until you're on top of it. So they will get run over if you put them in a place that's heavy traffic, like you know the, the narrows out by State's Land. And if you try to fish in that narrows with these tip-ups, you might as well just kiss them goodbye because they're probably going to get run over. And they don't, most guys don't do it on purpose, or gals, they just can't see them. Um, but I run a 10-foot long, usually an 8-pound test leader. They take a lot more abuse uh, when you're handlining these fish because uh, there's no cushion from the rods, no drag, so you're doing everything by hand. So I run 8-pound fluorocarbon leaders. Uh, hook size is, we run pretty small hooks. Some people like circle hooks. Um, I don't through the ice. Um, and the ball, good ball bearing swivel. And the leaders, I say 10 feet long because you're always, they're always breaking and you're shortening them, you're changing hooks or whatever. Uh, and they, you know, they start out 10 feet long and they might end you know, six feet long by the end of the season because you've been cutting them and breaking them. Or if you're me, you're just always in a hurry and you know, just throwing them in a bucket and having to replace them. So, any questions? So that's all I got. My voice is going. Yes? For lake trout, I run braid. I run 20 pound braid. I must have, I thought there was a slide on here, but I run 20 pound braid. Um, anyway, with a uh, usually six or an eight pound test fluorocarbon leader. On the white perch? Do you on the white perch, we just run straight mono or fluoro, copolymer. Yeah, something with either a low stretch mono. See, the fluorocarbons are better now. Um, Clam worked with Sunline this year to came up with Frostline, which has a really low memory fluorocarbon, which is really nice. I've shied away from fluorocarbon, straight fluorocarbon for a long time because of the kinks, uh, but it's really come a long way and they've, you know, a lot of manufacturers are, are, are making really nice fluorocarbons that don't retain as much memory, uh, but like a copolymer like um, P-Line, what's the line that I fished forever? No, P-Line. You remember, Chuck, what it was called? Fluoro ice. It's a copolymer. It's it's a it's monofilament coated with, with fluorocarbon. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. It's low memory, low stretch, but still has that that uh, better light refraction, so they don't see it as well. That's a good line too. Thanks, Thanks everybody.